Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So I guess quite a lot of you have heard the expression that uh, England or Britain is a nation of shopkeepers, supposedly said by Napoleon. Um, and I wonder how many people out there have heard that, first of all, and secondly, if you understand what that means. It doesn't literally mean that uh, Napoleon thought that Britain was a, a nation made up entirely of shopkeepers and not things like sailors and coal miners and the ver various other things that lots of British people, farmers, were doing at the time. Um, but what it really comes down to is the fact that during the Napoleonic Wars, there was a period during which uh, Britain uh, enabled its uh, enabled the opposition to Napoleon to continue fighting Napoleon by providing them with military hardware and other types of supplies in return, of course, for money ultimately um, and and favors and other things. Um, and this, of course, this profiteering goes on. Uh, in most wars, and let's face it, many wars actually happen for economic reasons, not necessarily for the obvious reason to gain a piece of territory or defend a piece of territory or for some political um, reason, um, but because it's in the economic interests of the nation which is waging war. Now, how does this relate to swords? Well, I'm holding here a 1796 light cavalry sabre. This is probably just one of the most popular models of sword, the, probably the most popular model of antique sword that people in antique collecting want to have. And one of the reasons is because they just look really, really cool. Um, in addition to, <laughs> the very loud scabbard, in addition to looking cool, uh, they were functionally good. Um, they seem to have pretty much universally positive um, appraisal during their period as a light cavalry sabre. The only uh, main criticism that's levelled against them is the fact that they weren't that well adapted to thrusting. And this is probably one of the reasons that led to the later more of a compromised design between cutting and thrusting and their replacement with slightly straighter, longer and pointy or spear pointed uh, models of sword. But that's for another video. The fact is, during the Napoleonic Wars, this was a very, uh, seems to have been a very well received, well respected, and loved sword. And, um, you know, it, it is what it is. It's, it, it performs well as a chopper, as a slasher. Um, it's, it's fairly light, it's fairly nimble, uh, it, it's everything that you really want from a good, um, sort of hit and run light cavalry sabre. Now, how does this link back to what I started saying about a nation of shopkeepers? Well, quite simply, Britain, as well as providing its own uh, military with things like this and brown best muskets and uh, even Baker rifles and things like this and various types of pistol, did also provide these to their allies. In some cases, they uh, were perhaps given, uh, usually in return for something, in much the same way as the Americans during World War II did Lend-Lease. So, you know, for example, Britain got lots of Sherman tanks, but they didn't get them for free. Uh, and, and, you know, Britain was still paying our war debts to America until about 10 years ago, pretty recently. Um, so it's similar thing in the Napoleonic Wars, not the same, but similar uh, in that military hardware and equipment, and obviously I talk about weapons on this channel, but this relates to other, you know, supplies, vital supplies that uh, people needed at the time were also provided. But these swords, because they were one of Britain's products, became quite influential on the continent, but particularly in Germany, or what is now Germany. Bear in mind, German unification hadn't happened yet, so Germany was made up of a, a number of separate states, some of whom were uh, fighting very hard against the French, some of whom weren't at that time, but um, in some cases, particularly Prussia, this model of sword was very, very influential, and it led to uh, a, a essentially a copy of it, a, a locally made, a Prussian made, German made, uh, version of this, which has become known as the Model 1811, or colloquially known as the Blucher, named after General Blucher, of course. So here is a Blucher. So uh, the reason I'm making this video is primarily because I have owned these at various points in the past, but whenever I've thought about making a video of one, I haven't had one to hand. But uh, here we go. Here is the Blucher, and you can see the outline of it is very, very similar 
to the British 1796 light cavalry sabre. One thing I should mention before I go on is the British example I've got here is an officer's sword. So there are some differences between the officer's sword and the uh, trooper's sword. The, the, the difference being an officer's sword is a private purchase thing owned by the officer. A trooper, so if you're a normal private soldier in the cavalry, you are issued your sword and that sword is owned by the regiment and ultimately by the government or the, the king or queen. Um, so you don't own your sword. And in many cases, each time you go out, you might not necessarily use the same sword. You literally get given a sword from, uh, from the regimental armoury. Although that being said, certainly within lots of regiments, I think there's quite a lot of evidence to suggest that a uh, trooper number corresponded to a rack number. So the so trooper would probably get the same sword most of the time and in some cases I'm sure some troopers asked for a certain sword because they were used to that one and that was their favourite one and whatever but they didn't own it. Right this is a government owned and issued weapon. So this is the model 1811 Blucher. The first thing we have to say is that during the actual Napoleonic Wars probably a lot of the light cavalry sabres that um, German forces fighting against Napoleon were using uh, probably quite a few of them were actually British made sabres, the um, 1796. Um, and it probably wasn't really until maybe the end, the, the later stages of the Napoleonic Wars, probably about 1814 or something like that, maybe 1314, that production of these in uh, German states, particularly Prussia, really got up to speed um, and that perhaps by Waterloo most of the uh, uh, Prussian cavalry, light cavalry, who had these were probably by that point using Prussian made weapons rather than British ones. Uh, but the initial supply was from Britain, and this is where we get this is one of the ways that we get the Britain being accused of being a nation of shopkeepers um, that we fought the war, we or they fought the war by um, selling stuff to their allies so that their allies could keep fighting the war, even if per se they weren't exactly fighting at that moment in every theatre. So this is a German-made uh, Prussian Blucher. Um, and uh, the other thing to say about this, apart from the fact that these were only really probably being produced in Prussia from the very end of the Napoleonic period, um, is that most of these that survive are actually later in period because these continued to be made. Now, I'm actually not sure when they ceased production of this particular model. If we look from about the 1850s onwards, then uh, swords which are clearly the um, descendants of this sword being made in Prussia and other German states are narrower than this. So what you will see is if you look at later 1850s right the way through to the First World War, um, German swords, you will often see that they do have this characteristic style of knuckle bow which originates of course with the British 1796 we could even say it originates with Austrian swords before that which is true uh, but in terms of its mass kind of um, um, sort of adoption in the German um, armed forces it does seem to have basically come via the um, via the British 1796 at least that's my belief um, so this style of hilt you will notice on German swords on some German swords even up to the First World War and beyond but they are usually coupled with a narrower and usually not quite so curved blade, often with a spear point. These are later models of sword. They're not the same model as the 1811 Blucher. The 1811 Blucher, as far as I'm aware, continued to be made probably until about the 1830s. And of course, remember that just because swords are being made, it doesn't mean that when they stop being made, they go out of use. It's very likely that, you know, most swords don't ever actually get used in combat. They just get kept in a regimental armory and issued when needed uh, and then put back again and looked after and stored and cleaned. So it is um, entirely possible that some of these were still in use as late as certainly the Franco-Prussian War, probably until the 1880s. In fact, I have owned one of these swords, which I think had 1880s manufacture marks on it, which is somewhat interesting. And it's possible that some of these were still in use by, let's say, less frontline um, regiments in the First World War even. But primarily, this is an early 19th century sword modeled on the British 1796 and you can see that it really is modeled on it. If I just pick up and bear in mind this is an officer's version so it's not absolutely typical but you can absolutely see the blade is 
very, very similar. I, I won't say it's a carbon copy because it's not. There are a few small differences. Now, what are those differences? Well, in terms of the blade only, we'll talk about the hilt in a minute. In terms of the blade, there are two differences, which again, 1796s vary, okay? This is an officer's one, but even the troopers ones were made by lots of different companies, so they vary as well. But generally, and I'm talking generalisms here, a general tendency is if you notice the edge bevel for the um, 1796 is uh, relatively broad, although it's a broad fuller. If I hold the blucher above it, you can probably see that the edge bevel is less deep on the blucher than on the 1796. And that is not always true. Sometimes 1796s have shallow edges like this, but that is generally true that the blucher has a um, more shallow edge bevel, should we say, less deep edge bevel than the 1796. The second notable difference, and again, this is not universal because 1796s were made by many different companies and vary, is that the fuller tends to finish more early on the 1796 blade than on the Blucher blade. But again, you can find 1796s which pretty much exactly match this. So those are very, very slight, marginal, minor differences, and they're not always a difference between this and the 1796 because you can find 1796s which correspond more closely to the Blucher. Um, in terms of uh, sort of, sort of edge, um, distal taper, shall we say, and thickness, they're pretty much uh, par for the course. There is a general tendency, in my experience, for the Blukers to be slightly heavier um, in the blade than 1796s. I can't directly compare these two because officers' 1796s are usually lighter than troopers' 1796s. A little brief comment on that, incidentally. I have commented on this in the past. There is a general rule that officers' weapons tend to be lighter than government-owned issued troopers' weapons. And the main reason for that is that government-owned weapons tend to be overbuilt slightly for durability. So essentially it's economic reasons. They want a sword to not break and to not have to be repaired. Um, whereas officers are buying probably a better quality steel product and they are more concerned with this being uh, light and quick and nimble. So they're thinking of it more from a fencing and kind of a swordsmanship perspective in general, uh, whereas the government-owned weapons are more, alike, are more like, what can we give them that they won't break? And that's also true of ri rifles and muskets as well, of course, that they tend to be overbuilt compared to something like a hunting musket or rifle. Right, now to the hilt. Now this is really, really where the uh, biggest difference lies. Now, Unfortunately, because this is a, an officer's weapon and I don't actually own a trooper's weapon at the moment, I've sold them all, uh, I can't do a direct comparison. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this aside because this isn't typical of a trooper's weapon and I'm just going to talk about the Blucher. So a general tendency, a general difference between the Blucher and the British 1796. So the uh, most obvious things to look for are, number one, the langette at the side here on the uh, Blucher is always a big semicircle like this, okay? Um, it's got quite a characteristic straight sides and then a semicircle. It's quite a characteristic shape. You do find some 1796s like this, but they tend to not quite look the same. They tend to either be slightly smaller or slightly pointier, um, sometimes even square, uh, but the Blucher is always that shape. So just looking at the shape of that doesn't necessarily tell you it's a Blucher, uh, but Bluchers always have them that shape. They are never any other shape, okay? Secondly, and this is very, very noticeable difference between the Blucher and the, um, and the 1796, the guard on the Blucher is a humongous bar of steel. It's really, really thick, okay? Now, just for this instance, I will pick up the, if you just look at the thickness of the um, bar, as it were, now this is actually quite a thin one. The troopers ones are a bit thicker than this. But if you look at the, as an extreme example, uh, extreme comparison rather, the um, 1796 bar you can see is made of much thinner bar stock than the Blucher. The Blucher is exceptionally thick. And I have never, ever seen a British 1796 which was made of a bar this thick. It's incredibly thick and incredibly heavy, and it very materially changes how the Blucher feels in your hand compared to the British 1796 Troopers version. The Blucher is a heavier sword, a clumpier sword. It's much less nimble, okay? They don't feel as nice in the hand as the original British ones do. It's often the way when you get something that's essentially a copy of something which went before. 
So the guard is very, very thick. Secondly, the German Blucher has a very rounded part to the knuckle bow here. Again, the shapes vary with 1796s, but you can see that whilst it has the same basic shape, it doesn't kick in quite as hard. And this is a general tendency to German swords that use this style guard. They kick in quite hard under here before they come down to this straight portion here. So the shape of that guard, again, you can find 1796s which are more like this, but this very exaggerated bulge and then in is a, a thing which is particularly um, a feature of the German or Prussian Blucher. Um, next up is the back strap and the uh, ears to the back strap. So just look at pictures of Blukas, okay? Um, they don't look quite the same as 1796s, and the general tendency, you'll notice that the back strap is in line with the blade here. The, the, you can get, as in fact this is an example, you can get 1796s where that is true as well, okay? But the general tendency for the uh, British 1796 is usually the hilt and therefore the tang is actually at a forward angle to the back of the blade. Okay, So again, not always the case. You do get British ones which are straight, but a lot of 1796s are actually a forwards canted grip, which the German Blucher isn't. The German Blucher is always in line with the blade. But if you just look, if you go on Google Images and look at M1811 Prussian Blucher um, Sabre, or Sable, um, if you use German <laughs> spelling then you'll find German web pages of course. The shape of this back strap is very characteristic to the Blucher. It's not a million miles different to the 1796, but it is always the same on Bluchers and very recognisable. And finally, and this is something which is quite Generally speaking, I think quite an easy to tell difference between, like visually, between the Blucher and the 1796. The Blucher has a very thick grip with a big bulge here. Now, that, some people might like that, okay? I tend to like narrow grips, so I have to be honest, I hate that. It's too big in my hand. And let's face it, I'm, uh, you know, I'm six foot one and about 185 pounds. I am big by early 19th century standards. There, um, if you look at 19th century uniforms, I can't fit in most of them because I'd be too big. Um, so that is a really big grip for people of the time. Yeah, you could argue maybe their hands weren't, weren't necessarily smaller than my hands, but I don't have small hands and that grip feels too fat for me. It fills up the middle two fingers here, really, really fat there, and then not enough for the little finger there, okay? I prefer a little bit less exaggerated difference between the wide part and the thin part. That fits in my hand a lot more comfortably than that one does. But I know lots of people in my own fencing club, for example, who always wrap tennis wrap around their fencing sword grips because they like the grips to be fatter. So each to their own. It's different strokes for different folks, basically. Um, uh, so, but it's very characteristic. So the main point I want to make is if you look at the shape of this Blucher grip with this real bulge here, it almost echoes the bulge of the guard. With this big bulge here and then in, is very characteristic of the German Blucher um, and very different to most British 1796s. Also, I'm, I forgot to mention the ears. The ears are this very characteristic, uh, almost kind of oval, like half an oval shape. And um, you do you do find British 1796s with that shape, but again, it comes down to the differentiation of the Blucher is always like this. So when you have this combination of features, the fact that you know that characteristic shape of backstrap, those characteristic shape of ears, the characteristic langets, the thick guard with the big sort of P-shaped um, bulge, when you have all and the bulge at the front of the grip, when you have all of those things together you know it's a Blucher. But I even still concede, even sometimes when I'm looking at uh, auction photos or uh, website photos online, uh, sometimes I have to do a little bit of staring at the picture before I can work out whether is that a 1796 that has Blucher-like characteristics or is it a Blucher? Um, so there we go. The, the nation of shopkeepers that provided 1796 sabres to Prussia 
um, in the Napoleonic Wars led to the Model 1811 Prussian Blucher Sabre. And these are not as valuable as 1796 light cavalry sabres, but because it's become so hard for collectors to get hold of 1796 light cavalry sabres, that has dragged up the price of these Bluchers. And these Bluchers are getting pretty expensive as well now, especially if they come with a scabbard, um, because obviously scabbards get damaged and lost quite often, separated from the swords. Um, so these Bluchers are nice swords. They are big, beefy. If you have handled the 1796 but not handled the Blucher, I would summarise it to you as like having a 1796 on steroids. Um, so basically a 1796 light cavalry sabre is actually a light sword. They look heavy because they're broad, but they're actually quite light. But these are like chunkier versions of a British 1796 and they feel indestructible. They feel very, very powerful, um, but they also feel quite like they've got quite a lot of weight in the hilt, which the 1796 doesn't. 1796 actually has quite a light hilt. Um, and last thing I'll mention is the other thing, if you're ever looking at one hands-on, if you're up close to one, um, or indeed if there are good photos on a website, a dead giveaway to know that it's a German sword rather than a British sword, is if you have any kind of markings on the sword. Now, uh, British 1796s will often on the spine of the blade here have a maker's name like Dawes or Gill or Osborne, okay, which are clearly English names. Okay, so there you know it's a 1796. Sometimes they'll have something etched on the blade which will tell you it's a 1796. It might be a George III crown or it might be the maker's name uh, etched rather than um, stamped. But if it's a Blucher, what Bluchers almost always have on them are a series of letters and numbers, usually along one of the sides of the guard here, and very occasionally on the underneath of the quillon here or sometimes on the top, sometimes somewhere else. But the usual place to find them is as this example has here. Let's see if we can get it to focus. There we go. You can see there are a number of letters, which that's the maker's name. That's the R, P, C and Co, I think is. Oh no, it's not, it's just R, P, C is the maker. Um, but then you've got some numbers, 8, 60, 9, 8, 4, I don't know what those relate to. So some of these numbers will relate to manufacturing details, some will relate to regimental. And I have had one example of one of these before where the letters and numbers on the side actually told you that it was for um, horse artillery regiment. Um, so sometimes you can tell who the sword was issued to from those letters and numbers. And very often you can tell who this was made by, RPC. I imagine is the maker, but I don't know who that stands for. Maybe Putsch, maybe? I don't know. It could be Putsch and Co. Anyway, I don't know. I'd need to look in my books for German sword makers. Anyway, there we go. The German Model 1811 Blucher. As always, I've handled both these blades liberally with my greasy hands. I will oil them now to make sure there's no further oxidization. In fact, this Blucher, before it goes on sale on my website, will need to be cleaned up a bit anyway. Um, but the Model 1811, uh, if you're not aware of it, go out and have a look for them. If you want something like a 1796, but you don't quite have the funds for a 1796, this is a good second secondary option and they are usually absolutely rock solid as well there's no movement in that at all you could you could probably break a breeze block with the, with this and not do any damage to the sword um, so there we go cheers for watching give us a like and a subscribe and i'll see you really soon for another video on scholar gladiatoria channel cheers folks thanks for watching we've got extra videos on patreon please give our facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already cheers folks